Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Dharma Pranam. Dhanabad Maya Bhisanthi, all glories to Srila Prabhupada. Okay, we'll just wait for a minute. Give people time. Yes, Prabhu. Uh, my brother is your old student, Maharaj. In Bhakti Shah, he old student. Oh. Yeah. Hare, Hare Krishna, Prabhu. He said, Hare Krishna, Maharaj. Can I put the team, Maharaj? Sorry? Hare Krishna. Oh, Hare Krishna. Can you able to see me, Maharaj? Yeah, I can see you. Yeah. Yeah, 2018, uh, 2017, old student, Prabhu, Maharaj. Where? Here in Mayapur? Yeah, uh, yes, Maharaj. 2017, I'm, I'm your old student. You came here in Mayapur? You stayed in Mayapur? Yeah, I stayed in Mayapur. Before, before Corona time, Maharaj. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Are you doing Bhakti Vai Bhav now? No, no, Maharaj. No? <laughs> I'm doing this, uh, just uh, uh, doing this uh, Bhakti Ruksha program. Maharaj. Okay. In, the, in in New Delhi, are you? Maharaj, Maharaj, Chennai. Or, or Chennai, oh, okay. Yes, Chennai. <laughs> Previ previously, previously also, uh, you... Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, nice. Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Yes. Okay. So we'll begin. Om Magyana Timarandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chaksurun Militanyena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Sarasati Devi Kauravani Precharine Nirvisesha Srinyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vancha Kaupata Rupyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhaihevacha Patitanam Padpapavanibhyo Vaishnavibhyo Namo Namaha Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare So welcome everyone to our ongoing study, Bhakti Shastri. And we're studying Bhagavad Gita. Today we're going to begin chapter number 9. Right. Uh, I'll share this screen. Is everyone seeing the PowerPoint? Yes, Maharaj. No problem, eh? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. So, lesson four, Raja Vidya. By the end of this lesson, students should be able to one. Explain the terms confidential, more confidential, and most confidential with reference to the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita, chapter 9, verse 1. A second point we want to cover, present the main philosophical points of the Rajavidya verse, which is 9-9. Two, the second verse of the ninth chapter. So we'll talk about that. And then third point, 
to cite the example of Narada in relation to Pratyakshavagamam. Pratyakshavagamam. Just a minute. And then the fourth point, to present Krishna's relationship with the material world with reference to Sanskrit terms and analogies as given in the Bhagavad Gita from verse 4 up to verse number 10. So we want to cover these four points in the course of the lesson today. Before we go on, we will, does everyone remember? Yesterday we spoke about the 8th chapter. Did anyone have any, any questions from the 8th chapter? Do you have any problems with it? Anything you remember? What do you remember from the 8th chapter? Anyone? Amara Nitai, do you remember anything? Chapter 8? Is everybody hear me? I cannot hear any of you. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. We are hearing you. Oh, you're hearing me. I'm not, I, I, your voice is very weak. Okay, now it's louder. Yes. Prabhu, uh, she has me. After that, I have some doubt. Maharaj, the point we learned yesterday was uh, Riksha, that uh, now Antakale Chamam, chamam Smaran, that uh, at the time of death, uh, certainly you'll have to remember Krishna. And Sri Prabhupada gave the best method is to do Diti worship of Radha Krishna. You always think within your heart. And also, you mentioned that one has to do service and chant. Together, we will be able to remember Krishna always. So, for a devotee, um, a devotee can leave at any time um, his body because a devotee is never bewildered. Okay, very good. Yes. Amaraj, I had two doubts. Um, in uh, text 16, uh, it said that those who progress in Krishna consciousness on the higher pl planes are gradually elevated to higher and higher planets and at the time of universal devastation are transferred to the eternal spiritual kingdom. So, uh, does that exactly mean that uh, from the higher planets uh, they go to the spiritual kingdom, they don't take birth again? Uh, means, of course, uh, um, Krishna conscious, uh, um, it's mentioned, but uh, I was uh, hearing somewhere else that uh, the last two planets, higher planets, they don't uh, devastate at the time of universal destruction. Is it so, or uh, I just wanted some clarification on that point. The higher planets, yes, at the time of uh, universal devastation, at the end of Brahma's life, they, they, they're devastated. But at the end of Brahma's day, there's only a partial annihilation. It's only the lower regions of the universe which are annihilated. But with the end of Brahma's life, everything is annihilated. There's total devastation. Right? Brahma's planet is also not eternal, right? Satya Loka. Yeah. So Brahma also dies. He also has to worry about giving up his body. Yeah. And there was one more place where. Uh, when light passes, uh, when one passes in light, he does not come back. So does it mean exactly for uh, devotees or anybody? Jnanis. Jnanis. If you, yeah, that's for the jnani, right. Not just for, that is just for the jnani, pass in the light. It doesn't come back. So the, the, that means he's in a liberated state. Uh, so, yeah, he's what? In a liberated state, uh, uh, does it mean impersonal Brahman or? Uh, uh, yes, 
goes to the Brahma Jyoti, right? Okay. He's a Gyani. So Bhishma Dura was ex waiting for this uh, uh, this period, no? So that does that mean he went to Brahma Jyoti or he went back to Krishna because he saw Krishna? Bhishma is not going to go to Brahma Jyoti. Bhishma is devotee. Yeah. And he was waiting. What was he waiting? He was actually waiting for Krishna. Yes. Not for the light to come. <laughs> no. Hmm. Then he was waiting for Krishna. I mean, the Acharyas explain it in different ways, right? They explain yeah. that actually he's waiting for Krishna. That's what he was really waiting for. Mm. Okay. So okay. But, Bish, but Bhishma, he goes to the planet where Krishna is Partha Sarati. Krishna has a planet there in Vaikuntha where is Partha Sarati. He's driving Krishna, Arjuna's chariot. So Bhishma, he was he was remembering Krishna in that way. Yeah. Okay. I get it, Mother. Thank you. Uh huh. Okay. Any other questions or comments about the eighth chapter? Master, I have a question. Yes. Uh, with regard to chapter 8, text 19, it says that during the day of Brahma, they manifest and uh, night they un unmanifest. At the end of Brahma's life, they remain compact in the body of Vishnu. So, like, I feel that Vishnu, I, I mean, like, Vishnu is transcendental and the living entities are not fires. So, how is it possible to remain compact in the body of Vishnu for millions of years? till the day of Brahma comes and they manifest again? Yes, that's the arrangement, that temporarily, because they enter into the body of Vishnu, they remain there for, for the night until the next day comes and then they manifest again. Your question is why is it when they're not pure devotees, how they can enter into yes, well, remember, they're yes, spirit, they are spirit souls, so it's the energy of Lord Krishna. Yes, it's all, they're spirit, The living entities are all spiritual particles, and they, so they all enter into the body of Mahavishnu. They, they came from there, they go back there. And all the elements of the material creation all come from the body of Mahavishnu, everything. The whole creation Thank comes about, right? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. Uh -huh. That remains like just a dormant seed, seed. Sorry? Actually, the living entity remains just like a dormant seed of a fruit. Okay. Yes. Like, like a dormant seed. Yeah, the seed. Of course. So they come out, they take their birth. Come into the material world. Actually, Maharaj, one doubt that if they are inside the uh, in the uh, in the Vishnu uh, uh, planet, why they are not becoming spiritual? Uh, why they are remaining just like dormant? They're within the body of Mahavishnu, and then they they have to come out because they still have some desire for activity. They have not finished, they're not, pure, they've not fully given up their identification with the material world. So they have to take birth again, they have to come, come back. And even great devotees like even, even Lord Brahma and even the four Kumaras sometimes, they also enter into the body of Mahavishnu and they take birth again because they still have their separatist mentality. They still have the desire somewhat to, you know, to have position in the material world. They haven't come to that stage of complete surrender and self-pure self devotion to Krishna. So they enter into the body of Mahavishnu and take birth again next time there's creation. Yes, you, you may say it's millions of years, but those millions of years, it's only, it's only one breath of Mahavishnu. 
In terms of eternal time, it's not a long time. Maharaj, uh, is it same for Dravaloka and the Dromaras also? Sorry, is what? Is it same for Dravaloka and uh, Dhruva Maharaj? Dhruva Loka, well, Dhruva Maharaj, he's up on, he's up on the pole star, right? That's a Vaikuntha planet. That planet is not annihilated. Even at the time of devastation, it remains subtle. It just remains subtle. It's not annihilated because it's an eternal Vaikuntha planet within the material realm. So at the time of the at the time of the annihilation, it's not annihilated, it, but it just becomes unmanifest. But it's still there. But it's just an unmanifest stage. Is it the case for Puri Jagannath also? Puri Jagannath? Well, I, I don't know about Jagannath Puri. I don't. The Holy Dham, you mean? Yeah, generally they say that that, that uh, Puri Jagannath is also not unhiliated at the time of devastation, I heard. So. Okay, yeah, I mean, we hear like that. You know, you go, when we go in Navadvip Parikrama and we go to Surabi Kunj, you know, Surabi Kunj was not annihilated. Even during the night of Brahma, there was devastation. But Markandeya Rishi, well, he, you know, he came to that Surabi Kunj, he was washed ashore at Surabi Kunj and he got the milk from the Surabi cow. Yeah. So even though everything's annihilated, uh, Navadweep is also not annihilated. Mm. Maharaj, I had one, one more doubt. Uh, so when we say that the upper planetary system people are in Tatwaguna, we are in Rajaguna, and the lower planetary system they are in Tamaguna, so is it that all the pious people are up and the non-pious people are down? Is it that the demons are, uh, asuras are in the lower planetary system? How do we understand who live in upper planetary system? There is some clarity that, uh, okay, now, uh, Swargaloka, demigods live, uh, rishis live in, uh, the, you know, Janaloka and Tapaloka, Satyaloka. So we know somewhere who, who lives where, but I'm unclear about who lives in the lower planetary system, um, well, well, it's not so clear. I'm also not very clear about this because we do see, for example, the planet of the Rakshasas is above the planet of Earth. Uh, yeah, that's what I was trying to understand. Because the, if, it, if it's in Sattva Guna, where are the how are the Rakshasas up? Uh, yeah, Rakshasas are up, the Yakshas are up, you know, they're, in, they're above the Earth, you know. How are they up there? And we, of course, then you have different demons like Bali Maharaj, he's in the bottom, in the lower regions, in the Sutala planet. And Bali Maharaj is a devotee, but he's there in the lower, in the subterranean heavenly planets. Yeah. And that Sutala Loka is just like Boykunda planet. So he's in Sutala Loka, Bali Maharaj, but that he will feel like it's a Boykunda Loka. Because Vishnu is there 24 hours for him. Yeah, Vishnu is with him as his gatekeeper, so nobody should disturb him. Where is this Pitriloka? That's also in the lower planetary system, somewhere down there. Yeah, we do hear that Pitriloka is in the lower planets, but we always hear about the that the, the, he wanted to go up to Pitriloka, right? But when we see the actual situation, according to the fifth canto, Pitriloka is in the lower regions of the universe. Mm. I'm not very clear how the, you know, but we always hear about they want to go up to Pitri Loka to be, on the, at least they want to be with the Pitris. Mm. So it, it appears Pitri Loka is somewhere in the lower regions of the universe. So it's puzzling. So does it mean that our Pitrus uh, have gone there or is it that they have taken birth again here? So what exactly happens to that soul? Well, uh, those souls who have some piety, who worship the forefathers, then they go there to Pitriloka. There, ha there has to be the qualification, qualification being that they were, they were pious and they worshipped the forefathers. So because they worshipped the forefathers, they were able to go there to be with the forefathers. So it's not exactly that if someone uh, passes away, like uh, my Prabhu's father is no more, so 
So that does does that mean that he is in Pitru Loka? We were no, we no, no, not no, like that. No. Okay. No. That has to be qualification. Okay. Okay, Maharaj. Uh-huh. Okay, we'll go ahead here. Connection with the previous chapter here. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, yes. Just one last question. Uh -huh. um, it has been said that um, soul is pure and part and parcel of Krishna. Um, so at the time of annihilation, how does this soul carry its existing sinful reactions? If only soul exists in the time of an, an annihilation. Well, remember, we have also the subtle body. So generally, the, the, the desires are there. The, the, the mind carries the desires of the living entity. And the soul also has that seed of desire. But generally, it's the subtle body in the form of the mind which brings with us the desires for the future. So at the time... Sir Maharaj, but I think at the time of annihilation, also the subtle body doesn't exist, I believe. Well, no, no, subtle, subtle body will be there. Sorry, what did you say? At the time, um, does the at the time, time of, of annihilation... annihilation at the time of annihilation, is what happens to the subtle body? Well, somehow there's certainly, we take our karma with us at the time of annihilation. It's there with us. Whether it comes with the subtle body or it's with the soul, it's there in some form. Because when, we, when the creation comes about again, we're going to take birth according to those desires. So does that mean, uh, Maharaj, uh, we are not just soul, we are something else besides soul as well? No, we are souls. We are souls, but we do have different... With, with the soul, there is also uh, the, the different attributes of the soul. You know, it's not that simply soul does nothing. Subtle body. Well, you have a spiritual body, you can have a spiritual body, and in the spiritual world you have a spiritual body, does it mean you, you're just soul? But the spiritual body also has senses, spiritual senses, and also spiritual mind, it's all there with the soul. So that means we are a package for uh, Sari Maharaj, not the soul, right? Not only soul, it has certain body. No, you have to understand what, soul, what is the soul. The, the, the soul possesses form. The soul has a form, you know, we have a form, we have a personality, we're people, we're individuals, eternally individuals. So the soul has a form and that, that with that form there's also senses and, and can perform activities. So you, you, you can't distinguish it from the soul. So which means soul always have a body. Doesn't matter if it's spiritual or material. Is that correct, Maharaj? Well, it, it's possible that we have, a, we, we, can, we have the subtle body. We see there are entities which have subtle bodies. And on, on the higher planets, as we go up the universe, the body becomes less and less gross, more and more subtle. And then you have sinful living entities like ghosts and so on. They have subtle bodies. They are not, they're denied the gross body. But on the higher planets, like up in the top of the universe, Brahma Loka and so on, they don't have gross physical bodies. Their bodies are subtle. And so the, soul, the souls are there, the soul enters into the spiritual world and develop the, 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 from the spirit soul, uh, there's a spiritual form, a spiritual body, which will develop, will manifest from the spirit soul. Because eternally we have our spiritual identity. It's all contained there within the soul. 
And when we purify our consciousness and get rid of the material coverings, then we will manifest our spiritual form. Raj, just one question. You mentioned that as we go up the higher planetary systems, we see the higher living entities having subtle body. Now, in, in pictures, we see that Lord Brahma having four heads and he's holding, uh, you know, uh, Japa, Mala, and his Kamandalu, and so on. How do we uh, see? Well, there's some, some, some physical, it just seems that there's some physical form there. Yes, those are shown to us. That's how it's presented to us. But it, just like, you know, although you, things may be subtle, they, they, can be, they can be there, they're just there in, a, in a, 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 a less gross form. It's difficult for us to conceive of it, because we're in this gross planet here. Everything is physical. So it's very difficult for us to conceive of how things are in the higher planets. But you have to understand, the topmost planet is very close to the spiritual world. So the attachment to the material energy is practically non-existent. It's just very, very much less. We're so absorbed in matter. But in the higher planets, that attachment, that identification with matter is much, much less. Yeah, you, as you say, there's commandalus, there's, com there's beads and so on, but it can all be there in an unmanifest form or in a less gross form. It's just something which we're not able to conceive so easily. We have no experience of it. We have to try to understand it by hearing. We hear about, you can read Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, you can read how Gop Kumar goes up to this, these higher planets, he visits each of these planets before he goes into the spiritual world. So you can hear about the existence in these planets. Okay, we'll go, we'll go ahead. So the eighth chapter, in the eighth chapter Krishna has explained that the ananya devotee, the ananya devotee meaning that devotee who is fixed in undeviating devotional service, that he surpasses both the path of light and darkness. Now Krishna will explain how to become such an ananya devotee. The first step is hearing about Krishna. Right? Is that clear enough? You can understand the connection? We heard yes, about the Ananya devotee, that, and we would naturally want to know, how can we become an Ananya devotee? We also want to transcend birth and death. So how to do it? So we're going to find out in this chapter, the ninth chapter, the most confidential knowledge. Verse 1 is most confidential because it describes pure, unalloyed devotional service. The beginning chapters of Bhagavad Gita describe confidential knowledge of the difference between the soul and the body. Chapters 7 and 8 are more confidential because they describe devotional service, which brings enlightenment in Krishna consciousness. All right, the beginning chapters of Bhagavad Gita, particularly chapter 2, remember we heard about confidential knowledge, the difference between the body and the soul. So that was all there in the beginning of the second chapter, not the beginning, but after Arjuna's surrender to Krishna. Then Krishna uh, explained the knowledge of the soul, and the difference between matter and spirit. So that's confidential knowledge. It's confidential. Most people, common men, they don't know. The people don't know this. They simply know only the body. They know only sense gratification. 
and they never thought about the soul. They never understood, oh, there's a, a spiritual particle in the body. And you have even people like Buddhists, they think the soul is material. They will talk about the soul sometimes, but they'll talk about the soul as material. So Lord Krishna was describing that there's a different energy. The soul is, is not material, it's different from the body. So this is confidential knowledge. You, we don't get this knowledge in the schools, you don't get it in the colleges. They won't teach these things. They'll simply teach mathematics and chemistry and laws of matter, Newton's laws. <laughs> so many laws are there. But they fail to understand the law of karma and the law of transmigration of the soul. These things are not known by common people. Then chapter 7 and chapter 8, which we have covered, that is more confidential because it describes devotional service. Mm. There were other things there also, just like in the 8th chapter we heard about Yoga Mishra Bhakti. In chapter 7 we heard about uh, different kinds of people who come and surrender to Krishna and people who don't. So it's, it's certainly on a higher level than the knowledge which was there in chapter 2, which was just explaining the difference between the body and the soul. So you have confidential knowledge and more confidential knowledge, because more confidential knowledge brings enlightenment in Krishna consciousness. There was no enlightenment in Krishna consciousness and just knowing that we're not the body. Just knowing we're the soul, that doesn't give enlightenment in Krishna consciousness. So more confidential knowledge is presented here, or has been presented in chapters 7 and 8. And we're going to get, of course, the bag, uh, this ninth chapter, Ninth chapter is called the most confidential knowledge. The most confidential knowledge. We'll see in chapter 9, we'll see the very special relationship which is there between Lord Krishna and his devotees. And that is the most confidential knowledge. To understand that tr the transcendental dealings which take place between Lord Krishna and his devotees. So understand the different levels of knowledge. There's confidential, more confidential, and the most confidential. Now when you go to the 18th chapter, we'll see also there that there's the, Lord Krishna talks about knowledge which is confidential, or guyam, and then he talks about knowledge which is more confidential, Guyataram, and then most confidential, Guyatamam. <laughs> right? So you've got confidential, more confidential, and most confidential. And that is in terms of knowledge of the Absolute Truth. Knowledge of Brahman is confidential, knowledge of Paramatma is more confidential, and knowledge of Bhagavan is the most confidential. So, everyone's okay with this? Different levels of knowledge. I have one question. As you have put the Vishnu figure here, why not Krishna figure? Is there any relation with this uh, uh, text? The, you're asking about the illustration of Vishnu? Yes, Maharaj. Picture that is there on the right. Well. What that figure signifies here? Well, that's Paramatma realization, realizing the Super Soul. Okay, Maharaj. 
That was one of the realizations. And just to put, we like to put pictures when we do these slides, you know, so didn't want to put too many pictures, just put the super soul. Okay, Maharaj Gautam. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to go on Raja Vidya. Oh, name one first of all. Okay, the very beginning of Bhagavad Gita, the first chapter, is more or less an introduction to the rest of the book. Right? First chapter was uh, on the battlefield, right? What's the title? The first chapter? Observing the armies. Observing the armies on the battlefield, right? And so it's an introduction. And the second and third chapter, spiritual knowledge described, confidential. Oh, we see this, of course, that it, you write a book, you have to have some introduction. Srimad Bhagavatam is like that, the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. It's only at the end of the first canto when Sukadeva Goswami appears. But before that, you have Sutta, Sutta Goswami and the Nemisharanya Sages. And then at the end of the first canto, after the cursing of Pariksha, then you have the, the appearance of Sukadeva. And it's in the second canto when Sukadeva Goswami begins to speak. And we see also in the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna didn't speak in the first chapter. It's in the second chapter when he actually beginning to teach Arjuna. So topics discussed in the seventh and eighth chapter are specifically related to devotional service. Because they, and because they bring enlightenment in Krishna consciousness, they are called more confidential. But the matters which are described in the ninth chapter deal with unallied, pure devotion. Therefore, this is called the most confidential. Unallied, pure devotion, Krishna describes yoga kshima vahami aham. That it, Krishna will reciprocate, he will carry what you lack, he'll preserve what you have. If you're the pure devotee, if you're an unalloyed devotee of Krishna, then Krishna can reciprocate with you like that. Not with everyone. So that is most confidential. So we see these different levels of knowledge are going to be explained. Okay, going ahead to the second verse, the Rajavidya verse, right? Second verse, we'll read the verse, maybe you all know it, Rajavidya Rajaguyam Pavitram idam utamam pratyakshavagamam dharmyam susukam kartam avyayam. The the knowledge, this knowledge is the king of education, the most secret of all secrets. It is the purest knowledge and because it gives direct perception of the self by realization, it is the perfection of religion, it is everlasting and it is joyfully performed. So here we have a quote from Prabhupada's purport. How can the soul, which is so active within this body, be inactive after being liberated from the body? It is always active. If it is eternal, then it is eternally active. And its activities in the spiritual kingdom are the most confidential part of spiritual knowledge. These activities of the spirit soul are therefore indicated here as constituting the king of all knowledge, the most confidential part of all knowledge. So Prabhupada speaks about the activities of the spirit soul. And the soul it's not just simply some spark of energy, but 
It's a person, it's a living entity, and it will have a spiritual form and can take part in many different activities. What kind of activities? Well, that's described. The activities in the spiritual kingdom, they are the most confidential part of spiritual knowledge. So we're not going to talk about the activities in the spiritual kingdom. Here we're talking about Bhagavad Gita. Bhagavad Gita is ABC. Let's get the basics right, and then you can go on to understand higher things. And we want to understand the soul and the nature of the soul. So Prabhupada was explaining the soul is active, it's not simply inactive. It's not just simply some light which has no consciousness, no feelings, no personality. No, the spiritual spark is a personality, it's a form, has activities. So we want to <coughs> We want to understand the nature of that spirit soul and how it is active. Okay, here's the verse. So Krishna, Lord Krishna begins, Raja Vidya, the king of education, Vidya. Vidya meaning transcendental knowledge. There is Vidya and Avidya. Avidya. People People like to go to universities and sometimes they go on to do their master's degree. Masters, they get M.A. We say Master of Avidya. Right? That is the result of their education, mundane knowledge. Simply they master Avidya. But here, Lord Krishna is speaking about vidya, transcendental knowledge, the king of education. So the, it is the most important part of education. And then Lord Krishna goes on to say, Raja Guyam. It is confidential. It's the most secret of all secrets. Why? Because people are generally not interested. People are all mudhas. They're all naradamas. They're all mad to enjoy their senses. They don't want to hear. And we we don't want to we don't want to try to teach them either because they'll just simply commit offenses. The ninth offense in chanting the holy name is to instruct the glories of the holy name to faithless persons. And so this knowledge is also guyam, it is confidential. Before people can understand this Raja Vidya, they have to first of all understand the basic knowledge. The, just like we said, there's confidential knowledge, more confidential knowledge, most confident. This is actually the most confidential knowledge, Raja Guya. So before they can ever understand the, the topmost knowledge, they must understand the basic. They want to understand Krishna, first of all, you have to understand who we are. We have to understand ourselves as souls. Then we can go on from that point. So this is why it's Raja Guyam, confidential. At the same time, it is Pavitram, it is the purest knowledge. It is the purest knowledge uh, because it's giving knowledge about the Supreme Pure. Lord Krishna is the Supreme Pure. He purifies everything. So this knowledge is the purest knowledge. It is not adulterated, it is not polluted by all kinds of nonsense speculation. This knowledge comes directly from Lord Krishna. 
So it's pavitra. It's very pure. Just like the holy name is very pure. But it may be, the holy name may be covered. And we, we don't perceive the real power of the holy name. And so similarly this knowledge, sometimes it becomes, uh, uh, it becomes polluted or it becomes perverted that people change the meaning and then, you, then the knowledge is lost. Then there's no more potency in that knowledge. Then you have yoga nasta, right? The knowledge is lost. So we have to keep this knowledge pure. We should not change anything. If we change it, then it's not pure anymore. If you make any alteration, you take something away or you add something, then it won't be so pure anymore. And then it is idam utamam. It is the topmost. It's the highest thing. It is ab above everything. It's the highest knowledge. And then pratyak shavakamam dharmyam. It gives direct perception of the self by realization. This is described for us in relation to the pastime of Narada Muni. We'll speak about that in a minute because this Pratyakshava Gamam, how we get direct perception by realization, not just simply by academic knowledge but by actual realization. Then it is su sukam. Su sukam. It is joyful. It is joyful. Very su sukam. Sukam is happiness and su sukam, very special kind of happiness. We see in Krishna consciousness, Devotees are generally bright-faced, at least they, they should be. There was one devotee, he was serving Srila Prabhupada, his name was Purushottam actually. And so Prabhupada had been talking about the moon landing and Prabhupada was saying, no, this is not the moon. And this man, Purushottam, he was, you know, he was thinking, oh Prabhupada, look, the, um, we've gone to the moon, this is the Americans on the moon. Isn't it wonderful? And Prabhupada was saying, this is not the moon. So this devotee got very discouraged and he could not accept Prabhupada's instruction. And he became very morose and depressed. And Prabhupada saw him and Prabhupada said to him, he said, if you are in Krishna consciousness, you cannot be morose. So one who is in Krishna consciousness is, is not morose, rather he is prasanatma, he is a joyful soul. So this, this is the nature of devotional service. We're not acting on the platform of the body. When we act on the platform of the body, then it's depressing, it's miserable. But when, we're, when we actually understand ourselves as spiritual souls, we should have the nature of the soul, and the nature of the soul is eternal, full of bliss and knowledge. So devotional service is joyfully performed. We chant and dance, and people were always surprised to see the devotees dancing, so happy. When Krishna consciousness first came in the West, people were amazed to see people so happy singing, dancing. This is the nature of devotional service. One who has this knowledge, they're very joyful. Then kartam avyayam, it is everlasting, right? We, we do these activities eternally. Unlike the, the impersonalists, the impersonalists, they may begin to do devotional service, they may worship Radha and Krishna, they may chant Hare Krishna, they may read Bhagavad Gita, but they're doing all these things 
ultimately with the goal of becoming one, that I will become Krishna and I will give up all of these habits. But the devotee is chanting Hare Krishna and serving Krishna here and in the spiritual world he will go on chanting Hare Krishna and serving Krishna there. That is the nature of devotional service, that it is not limited to just this place, but it is eternal. So we speak of devotional service as sanatana dharma, the eternal religion. We will serve Krishna, we will chant, we will do everything for Krishna's service here. And in the spiritual world, we will continue to serve Krishna. We don't become Krishna, we don't become God. We're happy to be the servant and we take full pleasure in serving Krishna. All right? So I'm ex now this pradyakshavagamam, we want to understand pradyaksha by direct experience, right? We want to experience this process of devotional service. We don't just talk about it. You can actually experience it. You can see this picture. I remember when I first became a devotee, uh, there was a Back to Godhead magazine and a picture very similar to this with the same devotees was on the cover. And the devotees, this is actually taken in Boston in the USA, and at that time in Boston, we had the, the BBT, the, the printing press was there, and the devotees were writing, doing editing of Prabhupada's books and producing Prabhupada's books. So a number of devotees were there, artists were also there. And you can see they're all wearing cloth, the, the ladies are all wearing cloth, same color. Those days we didn't have saris from India or anything. We would simply buy a big roll of cloth and we'd cut it up and everyone would get a piece of cloth. And so the, all the devotees were wearing the same kind of cloth, the same color of cloth. But they're all very joyful, they're all so bright-faced. They're having a, they're actually experiencing the pleasure of chanting Hare Krishna and being Krishna conscious. So this is pratyakshavakamam. It's understood by direct experience. We don't just tell people, oh, oh yes, I, I experience Krishna. No, we, we don't just talk about it. We actually show people, and take people into this experience. Join the kirtan. Everyone can enter into the kirtan. Everyone can experience the bliss the pleasure of transcendental life, it's actually there. And there's no qualification required. It's not like you have to be educated. It's not like you have to be born in a Brahmana family or anything like that. There's no qualification. And the example is here, like Narada Muni. Uh, we'll go on. Prabhupada talks about this in one lecture. Savagamam dharmyam. If you are hungry and are given very nice, nutritious, palatable food, you don't have to take any advice from others. You understand yourself. Yes, I am now feeling strong. I am now feeling energetic. This is called pratyakshavagamam. Dharmyam. Similarly, if you take to Krishna consciousness, that is the process. Then you'll feel automatically how you are satisfied. We all want to be satisfied. We are looking for that satisfaction. So we can find it in Krishna consciousness. We actually become satisfied. And the proof is that we're satisfied, is that once we come to Krishna consciousness, we remain in Krishna consciousness. And we end up dedicating our whole life to Krishna consciousness. 
we become so convinced about it that, you know, we get our wife or our husband also to become Krishna conscious, and then our children also. We get all the relatives, we bring all our friends and family, we convince others about Krishna consciousness. Why? Because we ourselves are so satisfied, we're so convinced that this is so, such a nice thing. Just like Prabhupada said, you get some nice food, you feel, oh yes, I am, wow, this is good food, I'm feeling strong, I'm now energetic. And so we come to Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada described, before coming to Krishna consciousness, we were dirty and black, and black faced, long faces, miserable. And we come to Krishna consciousness and we become like men from Vaikuntha. Shaved heads and tilak and shining faces. That is Krishna consciousness. That is the power of spiritual activity, genuine spiritual activity. You can feel it. Here is the example, Narada Muni, eternally chanting the glories of Lord Sri Krishna. And in Srimad Bhagavatam we have the example, Narada Muni telling Srila Vyasadeva about his previous life. Who was Narada Muni in his previous life? The son of a Yeah. Was he educated? No. No, no education. Was he very wealthy? No. No. What was his qualification? He simply appeared with his son. He some devotees during the renaissance when they came to at the guest, her mother was uh, giving the service at the table, he just put the prasadam, remnants their prasadam, and also served those devotees. Yes, right. Narada Muni was helping his mother, and she must have had some kind of guest house or something, because somehow some sadhu, some mendicants had come and stayed at their place. And it was at the time of the Chaturmashya, the rainy season. So they stayed for some time and Narada Muni was serving them and he would wash, sometimes maybe do their laundry and bring their cloth to them, bring the food to them because they're sadhus. So his mother, she would be reluctant, she would not like to go there, to go near them. She would just tell her son, take this, go and give it to those men and Narada Muni would be serving them in this way. And so it happened that Narada Muni would, that he got permission from the sages that he could take some of their remnants. The sages were very kind and compassionate on him and they allowed him, they gave permission that, all right, you can take some remnants from our plates. So Narada Muni accepted the remnant and Narada Muni's nature is also described Although a young boy, he was not playing games like football and cricket and all of these things. He didn't much like games. He did not, uh, he did not do a lot of fooling around and nonsense. He didn't, he didn't disturb the sages. He was a well-behaved child helping his mother. He was obedient and he was well behaved and he politely served the sages and he be asked them for permission to eat the remnants. And then he also saw the sages, how they were meditating, how they were pr uh, practicing, doing their spiritual practice. Maybe they were chanting the holy names. And it happened that from their association, after they left, then Narada Muni's mother was bitten by the snake and he was just a young boy, so he was left alone. So he took the opportunity to go and travel and he went around the world and he experienced life in all different conditions. 
He went to cities and he was in countrysides. He went to all different kinds of places. And then after some time, then he decided he traveled enough and he sat down and he began to meditate as he had learned from the sages. And he sat down and concentrated his mind and he was blessed with a vision of the Lord. The Lord appeared to him and encouraged him. And then the next life, after that birth, then the, ne the next life he, he took birth as the son of Brahma and became the great saint Narada Muni. And he's traveling everywhere through the three worlds, chanting the glories of Lord Sri Krishna. So this is Pratyakshavagamam. He directly experienced. Narada Muni was not educated, he was not wealthy, he had no material qualifications. But you don't need any material qualifications. What was Narada Muni's qualification? His qualification was that he had that association with saintly devotees and he had served them. So that was the, we were hearing about yesham tvantagatam papam jananam punya karmanam, right? Punya, he had that punya karma. He had associated with saintly people and he would served them. So he would learned from them about devotional service. And in this way he became Narada Muni, the son of Brahma, one of the Mahajans. And he's the guru of Srila Vyasadeva. So this is indicated here in this verse. By direct experience we can understand the power of devotional service. Maharaj, I have one doubt. Oh. Really? What's your doubt? Actually, uh, we have read that uh, Narad Muni is the Sapta Avatar. He is the partial incarnation of Lord Krishna. And if he is the Lord, uh, is the partial incarnation of the Lord, then how he become the son of a maid servant? He became the son of a maid servant because he was cursed because he misbehaved previously. In his previous life to being the son of a maidservant, he was a Gandharva and he was very good looking and he had a nice voice. But he was joking and he traveled in the company of young women and he began to joke with the young ladies and he began to sing the names of the demigods. He began to sing the names of the demigods and the Prajapatis took offense to that because we're only, when there is Kirtan, it's supposed to be Hari Kirtan. It's not meant to be Deva Kirtan. We're meant to only sing the names of the Supreme Lord. So Narada Muni jokingly began to chant the names of the demigods in Kirtan. He thought it would be amusing for the young ladies. So the Prajapatis cursed him to become humble and the, the curse was he would take birth in the womb of a Sudra lady. Is it clear? Actually, he is a partial incarnation, but how could he do such type of things just in the Brahma's place? During chanting, he was not chanting the holy name, he was chanting some demigod's name. So, but his incarnation, how could he do? That is my doubt. By the will of the Lord. I, I, I'm not clear about what your doubt is again. What, are the, what is it you're saying? Actually, Maharaj, he is a Still in character of Lord Krishna, but because he is known as Sakta Avatar. But being a Sakta Avatar, how could he do such type of way? And he got crossed. Well, he becomes empowered 
He becomes an, he became an Ashaktavesha avatar. He became empowered to preach the glories of the Lord. We are all Nityabada, eternally conditioned souls, but the Nityabada soul can become Nitya Mukta. It be, can become a liberated soul. So Narada Muni transformed. He changed. Right? Okay. The Nijabada souls don't have to remain eternally Nijabada. They can also become Shakyavesha avatars. They can also become empowered to preach the glories of the Holy Name. So Narada Muni, we, you, can, you may say, yeah, but we, we may say he's a jiva, but he's chanting the glories of the Holy Name. He's traveling everywhere. He's taken on that mission as the son of Brahma to go everywhere and chant, to distribute the Holy Name. And he's very happily doing it. And so Srila Prabhupada, just like Srila Prabhupada's own family, they cannot understand how Prabhupada's a great devotee. You know, Prabhupada's wife, oh, my husband, why you worship him? You know, <laughs> the family members, they don't appreciate the great souls and they didn't appreciate Srila Prabhupada. They didn't appreciate his books. They thought, oh, he's, he's spent so much time writing, he's spent so much time chanting. They could not understand the greatness of the person in their family. But Srila Prabhupada certainly the great soul he distributed the holy name everywhere. So he's also like Shaktyavesha avatar. I think Prabhu is trying to say that if Narad Muni is such an empowered incarnation, how did he had those skills and how did he became a son of Shudra? Is that that's what he's saying? He well, said, that, if he's but, such a, but that happened yeah. to him before he became the empowered personality, right? That's right. That's right. I think it's also to glorify the uh, uh, bhakti, the devotional service, the devotional service, intentionally like the I hope so. Yeah, you could say like that, just like Sukadeva Goswami. Sukadeva Goswami was an impersonalist on the impersonal Brahman, but he became the great devotee, the speaker of Srimad Bhagavatam. Shows us the power of the Srimad Bhagavatam. And so also the chat. This is, this is this is an example of Narada Muni. It is proof of the potency of devotional service. This is why we're saying Raja Vidya. This is why Prabhupada wrote about Narada Muni in his purport to this verse. He's describing Narada Muni, how he became such a great personality. How did he become a great personality? Simply by association with the Mahatmas, with the great souls. He took advantage of their association and he took their instructions and he went on. He also detached himself from the material world. He gave up his, his mother died, he didn't care, he went away. He just wandered around the world on his own and he became completely realized and completely devoted to the Lord. So next birth he became Narada Muni. So we can all go on to become great souls. We see like Dhruva Maharaj. Dhruva Maharaj was so attached. But look at Dhruva Maharaj today. He has his Vaikuntha planet and he's a, a very great personality. All right. We'll go ahead. Okay, we're going to the next section. We have to understand. Oh, okay, 9.2 with the Rajavija Sloka, then 9.3, uh, Krishna says, those who are, those who are not faithful in the devotional service cannot attain me, O conqueror of enemies. Therefore, there is of birth and death in the material world. 
then we'll certainly come back again. So in this way, Krishna... And now, going on to the next section, text 4 up to text 10, we're going to hear about Lord Krishna's involvement with the material energy. In verse 4, that all beings rest in him. In verse 5, Krishna says the opposite, that they do not rest in him. This contradictory language is meant to show that he is personally aloof from the workings of the universes and that such functions are carried out by his energies. Or we're going to look at this in some detail. We want to uh, consider Krishna. Ex oh, Krishna, I can't read it. Krishna explains. Krishna explains how his inconceivable relationship with the material world in verses 4 and 10. So this, this is the important part here in this ninth chapter. We want to understand Krishna's inconceivable relationship with the material energy. Again, quoting from Surrender Unto Me. Although all living entities are within Krishna, are dependent on Krishna, and are supported by Krishna, they nevertheless act independently. How can one who is completely dependent act independently? This is an inconceivable feature of the relationship between the living entities and Krishna. <laughs> All right? Can you, we can meditate on this statement here for some time. That we're all within Krishna and we're dependent on Krishna. So, it appears like we're fully dependent on Krishna, but at the same time we have independence. So, the question is asked, how can one who is completely dependent act independently? What is our independence in, the, in this world? What kind of independence do we have? Anyone? In what way are we independent? Surrender or not to surrender? Yes, right. Either to surrender to Krishna, to take shelter of Krishna, or to take shelter of Maya. Maya. Yes, that is our independence. Once we surrender to Krishna, then we're taken care of by Krishna and Krishna engages us and controls us and directs us. And when we surrender to Maya, then the same thing happens by Maya. We're fully under the control of Maya. We're directed by the Maya, by the material energy. So our independence is very partial, very slight, either to choose between Krishna or Maya. This is the inconceivable feature of the relationship between the living entities and Krishna. An example is given. Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur says, the governmental business of a king like Maharaj Ambarish, is carried out by his ministers, while the uninvolved king merely remains present. All the same, unless the king is present on the throne, the ministers are incapable of doing anything. In the same way, unless Krishna gives his support as the supervisor, Material nature cannot do anything. So, 
Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur is comparing the position of a king in the government. And the government do their business, but the king has to be on the throne. The king's not there doing everything, but he's there on the throne. He, the king simply is a king, you know, he's not going to do a lot of work. And let, but the king has to be present, he has to be alive. As soon as the king's dead, they, they have to have a successor. And without the king being there, the ministers are not empowered to do anything. So unless Krishna gives his support, material nature cannot do anything. This material nature needs to be under the direction of Krishna. Right? What's the verse in Bhagavad Gita? About material. Yes, that's one verse that uh, very difficult to overcome material nature. There's another verse, so Maya Dyakshina. Right? This material nature is moving. Yeah, material nature is under my direction. Okay, we're, go we're going to have a group exercise now. We're going to have some exercise. We want you to work on this. We say draw images showing Krishna's relationship with the material world. If you can draw, very nice. If you can't draw, then you have to tell us about it, all right? And you have to include Krishna's statements, Prabhupada's statements, and examples and analogies. And we're going to, how many people are here? How many is in the class today? 16, 16. Yeah. Okay, we have five topics, five topics. There's 9 and 9 So we want five groups and we have only how many? 16 people? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So there will be three people and one group of four, right? Five groups. Three groups of five, three groups, three groups, oh no, five, Four groups will have four groups will have three people in and one group will have four people in. But together there's fifteen Maharaj. There's fifteen of us. Oh only fifteen of you. Okay, then it's easier. Then it's groups of three. Five so groups. I do more. Five groups of three. Group one will do nine four. Group two, nine five. Group three, nine six. Group four, nine nine. And group five, nine ten. And then we want to hear from you about Krishna's relationship with the material world. We want you. If you can draw a picture, very nice. Uh, if you can't, you have to paint the picture in our minds by your words. And we want to hear what, Krishna, what were Krishna's statements in Sanskrit as well as English. And Prabhupada's statements from the purport of your verse. And then also examples and analogies. Is it clear? Okay. Yes, Maharaj. So we'll give you ten minutes. Beginning from now.
Yes. Hare, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Maharaj. I think we have to close the groups. We are we are done with the discussion. Really? We are waiting for others to join. Okay, so we'll close all the groups. Yes. Who's close? Who's who's who arranged the groups? Close. You should close the groups. Maharaj, we can't close the group. Amaran and my Prabhu have to do that. Where is he? What's he doing? How do I contact him? I'll try to send a, a message on the chat. Maybe he will get it. I think they're all in the... No, they're not present. I think they're all in the breakout room. Maharaj. Mm -hmm. I, I think they are all in the breakout rooms for Amaranitai and the others. They can't, they, they can't see this. They can't hear what we are saying. And chat also, they are not present. I'll just close the rooms, uh, all will be back. Yeah, you're very late. You should have closed the room five minutes ago. Is everyone back now? I think so, Maharaj. We can start off. All right. Group number one. Who is in group number one? Room one. Group one? Yeah. They are Nidhi and Dipshikavati. Yes. So you're going to explain 9-4 to us? By me and my yes. unmanifested form, the entire universe is pervaded. All beings are in me, but I am not in them. Yes? 9-4? None of us could draw, so we have some notes to share, Maharaj. All right. I have drawn a map, Maharaj, but uh, I don't know if it is cleared or not. Like, uh, Krishna is in the center. Krishna is in everywhere. Devotees can see Krishna, but non-devotees cannot see Krishna. Oh. <laughs> have that love in their lives like i have it's very bad i know but yeah devotees can see krishna but non-devotees in fact krishna is there but they don't they don't see krishna they consider they don't consider that archa vigraha form and krishna both are same they are not non-different okay but not okay good very nice well done yes yes and that, common people they don't have love in their eyes you're not in this are you in this group 
Yes, yes Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. We are in the same group. Oh, you're in the group. Okay, the three of you, is it? Yes, yes Maharaj. Oh, am I right? So, who's the spokesman? Yes. So the other example we were quoting is about um, the story you were telling about Vishwa, Vishwambar, uh, uh, sorry, Vishwana Chakravati Thakur mentioning about the example of the king, that um, till the king is there, his duties are being done, but without the king, nothing can be done. So similarly, Krishna is the source of everything but they cannot appreciate his energy coming through even though they are doing everything. But without Krishna's energy, nothing can work. So as Krishna says, I'm everywhere and everything is in me, but still I'm aloof. So we were uh, uh, thinking of that analogy of the pearl strung on the string. We can see the pearl, but we cannot appreciate the string. But if the string is not there, then none of these pearls can stay in the chain. Okay, thank you. Yes, anybody else wants to add anything to this? Prabhu, you want to add anything to marriage? Yeah, just, uh, and just uh, after the having the preventative means when our eyes will be oriented with the love of devotion, then only we can see Krishna directly or feel Krishna. Directly. Otherwise, this uh, Archa Bigra will see as just like a wood or made up of wood, stones, or the, like. So I like that other things. Well, if, even we may have devotion, doesn't mean we'll get to see Krishna, right? Our, our eyes will become oriented with the love of Krishna. Then only we can see, able to see Krishna directly. Mm. That's why the word is known as Pramandu Chattu Chakshu. Mm. But we see Narada Muni, like Narada Muni, he got to see Krishna, as Krishna spoke to him, but then he said, you won't be able to see me again in this lifetime. You won't be able to see me again in this lifetime. So, it's not just only pure devotion, there needs to be also the mercy of Krishna. Pure devotion, yes, Maharaj. Pure on unlimited love. Along with Krishna's mercy. If, if Krishna wants to reveal himself, then we can see Krishna. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. All right. And any other points from this verse? Okay. Next group, nine five. Group number two. Who's in group two? Nabras Prabhu, me and them. Okay. Read the verse. Read the verse and tell us what, or, or show us your drawing, or tell us. Maharaj, we didn't draw the thing. Nabraj probably will tell the points from Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Natsa masthani bhutani pashe me yoge swaram. Bhitta bhitta sa bhuta shyo mamatva bhuva bhavana. Krishna is saying here that he is the maintainer of all living entities. He is everywhere and everything emanates from him. Um, and every cosmic manifestation is part of him, but he is not part of that. Which means every, everything in this material existence comes from Krishna, but he's not part of the material manifestation. So Prabhupada actually um, 
um, has a, uh, he has actually um, described this in his purport that um, everything is resting on him. And we all cannot live for a second without his mercy. And uh, he also mentions in his purport that um, Lord Krishna is different from material manifestation. Yet everything is resting on him. And that is the mystic power of Supreme Personality of Godhead, Lord Sri Krishna. Hare Krishna Mahaprabhu. Okay. Um, let's see. And yet everything that is created does not rest on me. Behold my mystic opulence. So mystic opulence, the yogam aishwaram. That is Krishna's power. How could we describe this yogam aishwaram? What is it exactly? Prabhu, tell us. What is yogam aishwaram? Mystic power, mystic opulence. The power of Krishna um, that that actually manifests everything in this world. Okay. The, By the power which everything gets created. Yes, the 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 it's Krishna. Well, Prabhupada translated that everything is resting on him. That oh, everything that is created does not rest in me. It says, does not rest in me. So it contradicts the first verse. The first verse said, everything is resting in me. And then second verse says, it's not resting in me. So there's a, a difference between the first verse, 9.4 and 9.5. 9.4, Krishna said, everything is resting on me. All being, all, everything is resting in me, but I am not in them. He's, he's different from material manifestation. Yes, right. He's different from the material manifesting. So this is Krishna's mystic opulence. But everything is there. The whole material manifestation. Marijis, of course, in the previous group, they gave the example from the seventh chapter about that the, everything rests on I me mean, just like the beads are on a thread so you don't see the thread so here Krishna says he's the maintainer and I'm, I'm everywhere I maintain everyone and I'm everywhere but I am not a part of this cosmic manifestation for myself is the very source of creation so this is Krishna's power, that everything is coming from him, but at the same time he's aloof from it all. The Nike Maharaj, I want to add that uh, when creation uh, begins, just by looking at the Maya Devi, then creation uh, takes place. But he doesn't directly take place in the creation of the entire world. Uh -huh. Okay, he glances over the material nature. That will come. Mm -hmm. All right, so from 9.5, Prabhu's, uh, Amara Nitai Prabhu? Yes, are the, are, did you pick out any analogies or any examples there in the purport? Did Prabhupada give us any analogies or any examples? Yes, Maharaj. Yes? What examples does Prabhupada give? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Atlas holding the globe on his shoulders. Yes. 
Madhiji is not even in your group, but she's helping you. <laughs> All the planetary systems are floating in space. Yes. The planetary systems are all floating in space, and Atlas, Atlas, it, but Prabhupada, Prabhupada lived in New York, New York for some time. So in New York, there's a place called Rockefeller Center, and outside the Rockefeller Center, they have this big, big bronze figure of Atlas, and he's holding up the Earth planet, and Atlas is, you know, a super big, strong man, you know, huge muscles and biceps, you know, and he's picking up the earth, but it's really heavy. It's really difficult for him. And so Prabhupada saw this statue and he writes about it here in this purport. He, he said, Atlas, you know, he's holding up the earth with great effort, but Krishna is holding up all the planets effortlessly. All right? Are there any more examples there in that purport? Says there is no difference between Krishna and himself. Uh, that is uh, that is because uh, uh, he is absolute spirit. Yeah, I'm sorry, Prabhu. Say that again. Uh, there is no difference between his mind and himself. The Lord between the Lord uh, uh, and his mind, because everything is one for the Lord. For us, it is different. But there is a difference between mind and uh, the soul. Okay. Because in absolute spirit, everything is one. Uh huh. So spirit, everything is one. And Prabhupada gives an example. He said, "We may think of doing something, but we're not able to do it. It's it's just not possible. It's beyond our ability. But Krishna can do whatever he wants. Nothing is impossible for Krishna. If he wants to do something, simply by his willing." Everything is done. So that is the part, that is the something of the Yoga Aishwaram, the supreme inconceivable power of Lord Krishna. He does not touch the material manifestation, but at the same time, everything is created, everything is sustained, and ultimately it will all be annihilated. So he is different from the material manifestation and everything is resting in him. Okay, so we'll go ahead. Group number three, they're speaking about nine six. Uh, uh, we both mean uh, 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 Renuka Mataji and uh, uh, our. Rukmani Mataji. So we both were there in the group. So I'll just uh, read the verse. Yatha kasha stito nityam vayu sarvatra go mahan tatha sarvani putani matthani kupap dharaya. Understand that as the mighty wind blowing everywhere rests always in the sky, all created beings. Rest in me. So uh, here, Prabhupada gives an example of how uh, the whole sky. Uh, the biggest thing that we see is the sky, and uh, within the sky, the wind. Uh, the wind is there, or air is there. That is the biggest manifestation. And within the uh, within there, the movements of the air and uh, the movements of other everything that is there within this. So that this is how we can conceive uh, how the Lord has. Uh, uh, is moving everything uh, by by his uh, uh, basically everything is resting on him. So this is this is the picture that uh, uh, 
is uh, the one that we thought of showing that the, everything is resting on the lord um means the lord's energy is inconceivable actually it means uh, uh, it looks as though um, it's all in our hands but actually the everything is like under the control of the lord it, it is like um it it is moving everything okay like how the wind is moving uh, we think uh, um it's blowing everywhere but actually it is all resting on in the sky so like how the sky is holding everything like that the lord is holding everything even though it looks like everything around us is moving on its own like uh, I, i we would also like to quote the shloka of matta paratharam there is one more example we want to tell so after that we will quote the shloka um, mata ji you want to say that denuka mata ji this uh, hari krishna there's another one here uh, shila prabhu pa wrote in brahma quote uh, about brahma samhita the sun and the other great planets are moving uh prabhupad says that the sun is giving heat heat has so much of potency uh, diffuse heat and light but uh, it seems like the sun is acting uh, independent independently sun is moving freely but uh, but that is not true uh sun is moving with the uh in the absence of lord krishna and uh it's not moving freely uh the but everything is under the control of krishna but krishna is a new covid and there's an example given here that uh not uh, not even a blade of grass moves with of the the supreme personality of god he everything moves under his direction and at the same time krishna is a loop of everything hari krishna okay so okay. there is this drawing we made of uh, like how the 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 mala looks perfect on its own but actually it all rests on the thread which is not seen or conceived in our, by our eyes who is the supreme lord so in this mala we can see that uh, uh, there are so many creations in this world which uh, um, none of us can uh, see that actually the lord is doing everything like how the child is the, the birth of the child it looks as though the child is like uh, you know uh, by 9 months it, the child is just born on its own but actually the everything is done by the lord and uh, the like uh, even the flower like how the blade of grass cannot be moved by the without the lord sanction like that even the blossoming of the flower even if the sunlight falls on it the flower blossoms but everything the sunlight everything is being provided by the lord and um, we can see how the seed grows into a tree so the growth which happens it looks as though everything is growing on its own but actually everything is being done with the sanction of the lord the movement of the waves in the water or the water uh, means uh, the waterfalls which keeps happening um, uh, it's the, it looks as though the water is automatically flowing but there is a person who is controlling everything um, beyond us the planetary movements the inconceivable spe- uh, innumerable species that um, there are so many innumerable species not just the animals which we see around even the water animals what are innumerable tiny species we can sometimes see when we used to have tv we used to see the na- in national Geo- geographical channel where they so so many species which is which we might not even have ever seen before in our life so everything is being created by the lord and it just doesn't come on its own and the rain happening on time the four seasons which keep moving the migration of species everything happens on its own and um, even uh, 7.8 talks about how the Lord is the taste in water, and He is the ability in man. He concludes with that. So I would just like to uh, show that even though everything is happening, but there is one controlling person for all these things: the fire and the firefly. So every possible thing which we see around is actually being done by the Lord. It doesn't happen on its own. Edge. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Romani, one more thing. 
he was also part of our group. He, he also gave some inputs which we told. So anything else that needs to be added? Arugun, you want to I think the king Uthiya Bum probably is not there. Oh, he's not there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We can continue with this. Yeah. Yeah. We are done. Okay, so we'll go to the next group, group number four. Hare Krishna Maharaj, our verse is 9.9, uh, which Nacha maam tani karmani nibadhan nibad nanti tananjaya udasina vaj asinam asakam teshu karmashu and the translation of the verse is Audhananjaya, all this work cannot bind me. I am ever detached from all these material activities, seated as though neutral. So, um, we know that Krishna is always engaged in his pastime, and uh, according to Brahma Samhita, uh, it says that Atma Ramasya Tas Yasti Prakritya Na Samag Samagama. That is, uh, he is always involved in his eternal. Uh, blissful spiritual activities, but he has nothing to do with his uh, material activities. And Srila Prabhupada is giving an example of a judge here who delivers his judgment. And uh, for example, like somebody is given a death penalty or somebody has to go in a jail or uh, somebody has been given huge amount of money. So in this regard, the judge is always neutral. He has, uh, he just delivers the judgment and he has nothing to do with that. Even though he's instrumental, but he does not literally go and hang the person. Like there are others who are working on those um, penalties, like the corrections officers we have who are looking after these prisoners. And uh, uh, so Krishna has given instructions to his expansions. The, um, Vishnu Tattvas to um, carry out their, to carry out his orders into this material world. And uh, this living, uh, the analogy that Srila Prabhupada has given here is that the living entities uh, uh, take their different forms according to the past deeds and Lord does not interfere with them. So uh, though Krishna is behind this creation, um, he does not show that he's behind all this and he always remains aloof and then uh, he is always neutral and the tenth Srila Prabhupada gives here is uh, Udasinavad that means although he, is con he has control over all the minute details of material activities yet he is not engaged so I will ask other group members to add on to it if they would like to yes thank you very much any other group members to contribute? Who are the other people? I'm just drawn this. Uh, I don't know whether you can see it or not. Can you see? No, I can't see it. Blur Maharaji. Oh, okay. I, I no. Krishna. Uh -huh. And he's, uh, he's involved in the creation and the annihilation. Mataji, uh, put a little back so that we can... Okay. Let, yeah, that, that is better. Yeah. Uh, and the living entities with the various uh, species uh, to say that Krishna is uh, is behind all this creation and annihilation, but he's still not involved. He's the he's just like giving the others to do this the things, but he's just watching and but in fact he's actually he has his hand inside in the creation and annihilation also. Okay. I, I Yes. Mataji, just one request. Uh, when you when you present something, do something. Just uh, remove the blur that you have kept at the back, so that. I, I'm sorry. I I am not sure how to do it because my daughter is not around. No problem. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Okay. Hare okay. Hare Krishna. Thank you. Maharaj, the one more example I thought of for this verse was the doctor's role. He actually is not, uh, he is just uh, trying his to, to do his duty of uh, curing the patient, not exactly kill him or means it doesn't bind him. So, apart from the high court judge, the doctor's role also. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Doctor. 
Maharaj, I also picked up a point from here, Maharaj, that the, when the High Court judge gives his uh, worthy, he's very neutral. He doesn't cite the anyone there. Like uh, Krishna is also very neutral when he does anything. Is that correct, Maharaj? That yes, they do not partial. The judge is not partial, and Krishna is not partial. Yes, Krishna says that in Bhagavad Gita. Krishna says, I envy no one, I'm equal to everyone. But then he said also, whoever renders service to me, he's in me and I am in him. So Krishna has such special affection for his devotees. Okay. Uh, we'll hear about that in this ninth no, chapter. Like no, because in this ninth chapter, they put that Krishna acts neutral, like the judge, you see, yes. they not partial. Yes, Krishna not... Is, is neutral. Just yeah. like Prabhupada gives the example that a mother, a woman, she likes all children, but she will have a special affection for her own child. Okay, I understand, Maharaj. Mm -hmm. All right, so we have one more group. Group number five. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna, Yashoda, right? Mayat Yakshina Prakriti Shuya Dech Sachara Charam Hetuna Nina Santina Jagadi Pariva Tade. This material nature, which is one of my energies, is working under my direction, O son of Kundi, producing all moving and non moving beings. Under its rule, this manifestation is created and annihilated again and again. Okay. Yes. Here is Krishna. Okay. Krishna is, uh, yeah, Krishna is uh, controlling the material energy. Yes. Which is which is giving uh, producing the moving and the non-moving entities, but they are actually coming into existence because of their past activities and um, desire. And Krishna is. Uh, not a part of it. Krishna is detached from that and it is under Krishna's direction that they are created again and again and annihilated again and again. So in the purport, uh, there are two, uh, there is one example that Srila Prabhupada gives of the flower that is, uh, that the fragrance of the flower, if the person is smelling the flower, then the person is able to sense, uh, smell the fragrance, but the fragrance and the flower, they are detached from uh, although they are in the same thing, but they detached. Similarly, Krishna, although he is injecting the living entities into the material nature's womb, he is not responsible for the activities of the living entities. For example, the CEO of the company, he, may, he might be recruiting the employees, but he is not responsible for the activities of the employees. It is based on their activities that they are rewarded or punished, but it is not the CEO who is responsible. Similarly, although the Lord is the chief giving father of all living entities, he is not responsible for their uh, for their situation in this material world. Uh, however, it is not without the Lord's sanction that anything in this material world can take place. Mm. Okay, very nice. Yes, good. Anybody else from the group like to contribute there? Okay. Coming back. Actually, even the example of the uh, cashier can be uh, told here. I felt Maharaj means he is counting everything, but he is not uh, um, the own owning anything. Oh, okay. The cashier he takes the money, but it's not his money, right? Yeah. Or the banker, the one who works in the bank. <laughs> Not his money. Okay, so here's the the different points anyway from the verses. Number Flamma four. The fragrance of the uh, flower. Yes, yeah, that yeah. fragrance of the flower. That was touched. That was explained. Text number ten. Mm. That was explained. The the lady explained that. Right. Number four. We had the misconception that the Lord loses his existence 
That doesn't happen. The Lord maintains His existence. He's always the Lord, eternally. I don't think that point came up. That wasn't brought up in our discussion, that the Lord keeps His existence. We did hear about the analogy of the king and the government, and we heard about Atlas laboring to lift up the planet. In text number six, Krishna cites an example of how the wind rests in space. So we heard that, yeah, the wind resting in space. And then number nine, the judge punishing and rewarding different people, we heard that. And then number ten, the analogy of the flower. Smelling the flower, but not touching it. Okay. Uh, here's a point from the book Surrender Unto Me about the Maya Jakshin in 910. That Maya means by me, and Adi means from above, and Aksha means eyes. Then Maya Jakshina means under my eyes. So everything is done under Krishna's supervision. This is one way in which we can understand this verse, Mayadhyakshena. Everything is done under the supervision of Lord Krishna, under Krishna's eyes. Okay, so we're finished. Are there any questions on this chapter? Oh, well, we've only done the first ten verses. Anyway, next class we'll go on to look at the other section of the ninth chapter. Any questions? Any problems? Okay, so we'll finish there today. Thank you very much. So have a nice week and we'll see you next weekend. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada ki. Go back to Vrinda ki.